Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries, and uh, our audience on YouTube. Greetings. Today is one of my favorite topics, part three. Don't you love part three? Everybody goes, I didn't know part one. I didn't have part two. Well, one part one and part two is online, so you can do your homework. Uh, but this is part three on discernment. It's my favorite subject, and it's just it's not lifting. And I'm, I'm finding new and exciting things to say about the same subject, so you're going to get it. Both barrels today. Um, discernment. You know, God made us thinking, feeling, choosing beings. He made us with those uh, opportunities to feel, to see, to hear. And at the same time, I realized early on that you cannot be more spiritual than your emotions allow. And emotions have been a neglected topic. They've been problematic. And I understand why. Uh, The carnal emotions are like the lowest, most unreasonable part of the soul that exerts power in swaying the will. It wants to make it go. Actually, the emotions are like a spoiled child who always gets its way, if you let it. Anybody can relate to that? Any of you ever a spoiled child that always got its way? Uh, But that's what the emotions are like. They... uh, Almost the entire life of a person can be controlled by emotions if they allow it, if they don't know how to remedy it, how to bring it to Jesus. And in in a supernatural exchange, a transaction has to take place to where it changes to the fruit of the Spirit or peace. That's the God emotions, and that's the original intent for you even having emotions. But if the emotions come under the control of the Spirit, it can't act so independently. Like that spoiled child, you're saying, sit. You you will sit. You will not be destroyed by sitting, but the Spirit's going to rule. And when the Spirit rules, the emotions come under the control of the Spirit. It, it's lost its ability to, hey, I want what I want, and I want it now. And you go, no. And you actually have the power to say no. Your spirit is an organ that God gave you to rule in that he will rule with you as the peace of God rules. They have to yield to God's approval or permission. Really, it's like, it's like training children then, isn't it? To train your senses to be exercised, to obey, and get under the rule of the spirit, they need to get under control. They don't get annihilated. You don't ignore them. You bring them into submission. The mind, it, it usually rationalizes and supports the emotion. You know the mind has the capability of agreeing with any wild emotion. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be good. Yeah, it's, and, and Christians will even put God in it a little bit, and they'll say, yeah, 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 I think God wants me to have a whole dozen donuts today. Yep, yep, I, can, I, I, I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. But we know that that is not discernment. That's merely excitement, hype, and (laughs) rationalization. So, uh, but the person who lays down his own likes and dislikes, he'll delight in what God has for you. And that's really, really where I think uh, uh, we're we're watching for a major turnaround. And I think uh, I just totally enjoy the fact that Jean got a major healing and a turnaround. And I think she's going to be a prophetic sign and a symbol for a turnaround. And we need a turnaround. I also 
keep Jennifer in prayer. I believe she's got another book in her. <laughs> but we may or may not do anything, depending on how things go the rest of the year. But uh, she needs a download anyway, so you can pray for the download. We have the topic, but that's not enough. You need that download where all of a sudden it comes faster than you can think. Um, so our emotions are like that bad kid always gets what it wants. The mind rationalizes and very often supports that bad child. Uh -huh. And the will, that's the highest faculty you've got of the soul. Mind, will, and emotions, that's that will. But it's like a door. It's, it's going to open or close based on who's running the show. If the emotions are running the show, if the thoughts are running the show, it's going to open or close the door based on who's running the show. So you need Jesus to be running the show <laughs> to uh, cultivate discernment. Our life is habitually controlled by carnal emotions and mind, but it will usually permit whatever pleases our emotions. A spirit-controlled will unites God's will with our will, and we're able to rise above the carnal emotions. So... When the spirit and the soul take action together, it's a straight line. That's a, a concept to think of. You don't annihilate the mind, will, and the emotions, but like sails on a ship, you want the wind that blows it and directs it to be the Holy Spirit. And when another way of looking at it is that when your spirit is lined up with your mind, will, and emotions, it's in alignment. It's like a straight line. It's like God mind, will, and emotions. You become really the person that you were meant to be, a new creation reality. It's a beautiful thing to look at because the soul has to be on the level of the resurrection life. Remember, if Jesus lives in you, then that resurrection power will give life to your mortal body, your death-doomed body, all right? If that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you, then you want that level of resurrection. And this depends on your yieldedness to God. That level of resurrection needs to, needs to be equal to your mind, will, and emotions so that it flows in a straight line under lordship. So the goal is for a straight line. We're going to scare you straight today. And hopefully, hopefully, hopefully you'll have spirit rule. All right. But when the soul is on a level of resurrection life, then the law of the spirit of life sets you free from the law of sin and death. Mm -hmm. So the law of sin and death is the lower life. You want the higher life. And the higher life, uh, you're going to obey a law. So it's really, you choose which law you're going to obey. You're going to obey somebody. For all the independent thinkers out there and all the independent people that nobody going to control me, yeah, yeah. Famous last words. Somebody's going to control you, and it's either going to be the world, the flesh, or the devil, or God. So good luck with being independent. The independent self is at the mercy of so much, where we, under God, are in the place of safety. It's a, it's a parallel kingdom that God wants you to live in. You know, in this world, there's a, there's, a, there's a ways of the world. But in the kingdom, you know, what did, what did Jesus say? He, to, he told the disciples, hey, look, pay your taxes. But seek first the kingdom. It, it operates while that other junk is operating. But you don't have to be part of it. You can be in that other realm, the realm where Jesus rules. Now, when the spirit and soul take action together in a straight line, and the law of the spirit of life is lifting you up, not the law of sin and death pulling you down, touching another spirit and the ability to tell why are two different things. You need both to point out sin committed and assess the cause of the trouble. In other words, we need a workable spirit. You really can't minister to somebody with guesswork. You can't really minister to somebody just uh, with a question and answer sheet. You can minister to somebody when you recognize that you have the discernment to recognize the source, the personality, the motive. 
And even then, it's another thing to have a solution. And so I, I'm so proud of this church that we have so many people that are capable of helping someone else do just that. Diagnose by the Spirit. And knowing that discernment is, is works by love. And it has a redemptive solution once it discerns. So discerning is one thing. Solution is another thing. So we need a workable spirit, which is able to diagnose another spirit. And you know, the Bible talks about spirit or spirits 990 times. And yet the emphasis in church is the word, the word, the word. But you can have the word without the spirit. We need both because the word and the spirit are in agreement. But it's a living word. I'm not interested in ink on a page. I'm interested in a living word that is applicable, that's alive, that's full of Jesus, to where you meet the author when you meet the word, and then you have it applied to your life in reality. To be useful in discernment requires that you know how to use your spirit and you, you know how to help others. And I'm so proud of this church. A lot of people run from that. They want, they want you to just tell them they're okay, wave over them, and they're all better with no effort on their part. But in reality, the Christian walk is just that. It's called a walk because it means you're supposed to be taking steps at a time. And you, you start out with baby steps. As a matter of fact, you probably start out crawling <laughs> before you walk. Oh, God, help me, please. I, if I could just make it to the altar, I'll be okay. You know. And eventually you learn, I can walk up to there. I can go saved. I can get filled with the Spirit. And I can... Walk in the spirit. I tripped a few times, but don't laugh over me, my enemy, because when I fall down, I get back up. Though a righteous man fall seven times, he gets back up. Actually, sometimes that's the best way to learn. You know, I don't want to do it that way again. You know, so we need to recognize the source of things to avoid being deceived. And I believe, particularly in the uh, the atmosphere in the, of the world right now as it exists with so much hostility um, that I think we need to recognize the source of things to avoid. Um, I even wondered, what about those people who have no feelings whatsoever? And I think, by and large, if they say they have no feelings, at all, they really have fear. Fear guarding their heart and their mind. They just won't recognize it. It's uh, narcissists, fear, sociopaths, fear, but yet they will look emotionless. But in reality, they're so controlled by fear that they have no sense of conscience. So they can just go do whatever. And it always reminded me of when we've seen some quality healings with people's lives with the fear guard, major breakthroughs in people's lives. The fear guard, the best illustration of that is quite simple. It's like if you were lived in an abusive climate where mom and dad were, were abusing each other, yelling, screaming, a lot of yelling and screaming and a lot of maybe even hitting, and you were raised in that and you went and hid in the closet, uh, the demonic would love that scenario because the demonic will come in and say, you're safe in the closet and there's a half truth. Compared to what's going on in the living room, it is true you're safer in the closet, but you're giving in to a fear guard saying, I will keep you safe. And you grow up the rest of your life being isolated, withdrawn, and having a fear guard, but thinking that you're safe. The only true safety comes from God, who will guard your heart and your mind, not fear. So anyway... I love it because uh, we need to recognize the source of things to avoid being deceived. And source is important. The belly is the part of that depth of the entire being. God uses man's innermost being, not merely a carnal nor a uh, vessel. The proper organ of spirituality is the spirit. You have a spirit, you need to exercise it and use it appropriately. Um, out of your belly will flow rivers of life. Uh, so 
there's two, two things we want to kind of get to today is becoming a usable spirit so that you can actually help other people. You can't, you can't give them something you don't have. So maturing in the things of God make you a candidate to have a usable spirit to help other people. And then the training of that spirit, you need to learn so that you can be useful. Therefore, you must learn personal dealings of the Lord. You have to start with you, right? The Lord is looking for dependable people, and the more discipline you get in your life, the more usable you become. Now, uh, we once did a seminar for a, a major counseling ministry, and I think we kind of uh, blew them a little bit out of the water because ours was easier. And they came up with, I got a scripture for you, Dennis. <laughs> The spiritual person is able to discern and assess all things. 1 Corinthians 2.15. And quite frankly, yes, you as men and women of God are supposed to be that spiritual man that discerns all things. All things. What does that mean? It means all things. That means every area of your life requires discernment. There's no area that is exempt from you needing to make a, a distinction as to who's the source here. Who's, who's really operating? Am I, is, it, is this area of my life flowing like a straight line? And we talked about hindrances to your d developing discernment. You can be in the church and be biblically literate. You can know the Bible inside out and backwards and not recognize the Holy Spirit if he was wearing a red baseball cap. And that happens. You need both the Word and the Spirit, and you need to know how they're joined together as, as you being a new creation and that reality, that's your personhood. Now, the hindrances to having that developed and becoming a usable Christian is low fellowship with God. Your prayer time almost doesn't exist. Your discernment doesn't exist, trust me. Uh, low word level. You don't know your Bible. You don't read. You don't take the time to get into the Word. Because in reality, that's where discernment begins doesn't begin with discerning other people. It begins with letting the word discern you. When you read, do you let it correct you? Do you let it encourage you? Do you, do you allow, are you open to it? Or are you reading it for intellectual information? Because that's the, where the difference lies. It's not about intellectual information. It's about discerning you. How do you line up with what the word says? Remember, a usable spirit operates in a straight line. Spirit, soul, body, a straight line, it flows. And it's the will of God to include all those areas. Low word level. You're not letting it, you're not letting God's standard discern you. So that means you've got standards of your own making, your likes and dislikes, so to speak. No, uh, Pride gets in the way. I can remember ministering to a guy who was so demonic, his eyes turned as black as two pieces of coal. And, of course, he wanted to kill me. That's what he, At least that's what the demon said. I want to kill him. But uh, the part was when you went to minister to him, the head tilted back. Isn't that interesting? It's just like Scripture says. Lofty look. Condescending. I see it on TV. I get the... I get a funny feeling because you have news commentaries that will look at their guests like that. Now, it might be their bifocals. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. But in reality, it's a condescending look like I know better. And pride interferes with discernment. He said, that might work for other people, but I'm complicated. Yeah, you're complicated, all right. It's actually quite simple. Pride's root is in sin. Humility's root in, in God. I know where your root is. <laughs> so pride. Now, some of the things to look out for when it comes to discernment as Christians, because, you know, in the, if you're not discerning with the eyes of Jesus and you don't have the heart of Jesus, you're just judging. And so... Uh, Prejudice imitates a bad witness. In other words, you already have an opinion. And you're so locked into that opinion that if the Holy Spirit moved in a particular way, you go, that's not God. 
That must be New Age. People need to watch out calling something New Age that's the Holy Spirit. There's unforgivable sin to come against the Spirit. There's, there's, there's a consequence to that kind of talk. And yet people are real fast with that. Why not say, God, what is that? Was that you? Or was that not you? Wisdom searches out a matter. That's the more scriptural approach. It may or may not be, but you need to not just level a lay out a judgment without thinking. No. Lust counterfeits as a good witness. So prejudice can counterfeit as, I don't witness that. But lust counterfeits it. Yeah, it's it's got an agreeableness. I like that. Mmm, that's got to be God because I want it really bad. I'm craving, which should have been a telltale sign right there. Craving <laughs> It's a clear indication of lust. But oh yeah, I, I think God wants me to do that. All right. So it's not just likes and dislikes, preferences and prejudices, but even uh, what we do on Tuesday night, the purpose is Hebrews 5.14, having your senses exercised. We like to give opportunity to see, hear, feel what you feel God's saying. And we're actually quite adept at that on Tuesdays. Very impressed. It's real and it's relational. It's not coming from the head. Uh, the... Opinions can block your discernment. A faulty value system. You got some value system other than the Word of God. But even attributing discernment to the wrong realm, attributing it to an evil spirit instead of the Holy Spirit. But there's something that's even uh, added to that is what if your discernment is right? and have a non-redemptive solution. That's something wrong with the heart. Because redemption is the name of the game and real discernment flows out of an overflow of love. If it doesn't come out of love, all right. There's five areas to discern. So I'll give you the five in advance so that I can go freely as long as I want. <laughs> First of all, you discern prophecies. Secondly, you discern spirits. Third, you need to test it by the Word of God. Fourth, you test the spirit. And five, you test it by the fruit. In other words, if you hear something goofy in your head and you're not sure whether you should accept it or not, it doesn't hurt sometimes to just play it out. What would the fruit be if I did that thing I heard in my head? What would it look like if I carried that out? <laughs> if it looks disastrous, it's not God. <laughs> God is redemptive. So discerning prophecies, you'd have to discern whether something's of God or not. You got to learn to discern right or wrong. And something that's important, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So nobody's out of control with the spirit telling them, I just got, I have to say this because uh, I have no choice. That's ridiculous. The spirit of the prophet subject to choice. God doesn't override your will and make you say something, all right? You have to, you still have your will to yield, to submit to it or not to submit to it. The, the discerning person rules their spirit. And there's two scriptures that the Lord used with me early on as a young believer. Proverbs 16, 32, he who is slow to anger, and that's a, that's a real good prerogative for understanding this sermon. Slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than him who takes a city. 
In other words, being under the control of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than a mover and a shaker who just runs rampant over people's lives and say the Holy Spirit did it. In my first pastorate, I had a guy who, who beat his wife, and the sad part was, not the sad part is he beat his wife, but the worst part was he would say, the Holy Spirit made me do that. And she didn't know what to believe. I mean, talk about deceived and talk about abused. Uh, he needed arrested. Now, Proverbs 25, 28. He who is slow to anger. Uh, oh. um, I don't have it here. I have that one duplicated. Um, he who is, um, rules his spirit has no rule. That's right. He who has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Now, what would that mean in a, in a personal way? It means if you have no rule over your spirit, your walls are down and the enemy can run roughshod. He can go, he has all kinds of access to your thoughts, to your emotions. You have the only legitimate wall is one who rules his spirit has the peace of God guarding his heart and his mind. But who does not rule, has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. The enemy just has a field day. The only legitimate wall is the peace of God between you, between other people. Maintain your peace in a hostile environment. Uh, you will be, you will get stronger and stronger and stronger in the days ahead. Um, here, here's a statement. Somebody quoted this. I don't even know who quoted it, but it said, it is God's will for us to be in communion with him and with others in the faith. Let us not run from intimacy, but rather seek intimacy with God. If you seek intimacy with God, the other part will take part. If you don't see the other part, there's something wrong with your relationship with God. It says, you will find yourself properly connected to his people as well. If you are not properly connected, there is a discernment issue between intimacy and God. There's something in the way. There's no such thing as me and God are great as these people I can't stand. You know, <laughs> I'm going to read that again. It is God's will for us to be in communion with him and with others in the faith. Let us not run from intimacy but rather seek intimacy with God and you will find yourself properly connected to his people as well. To be properly connected to his people as well means that intimacy is not being pursued because that would be God's directive. Second element besides discerning prophecy would be to just discern the spirit. And God distributed the gifts. And discernment is one of the gifts. But 1 Timothy 4.1 gives a warning. Now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Discerning of spirits is able to discern the spirit world and especially detect the true source of circumstances or motives of people. So 1 John chapter 4 gives us some uh, information. It says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they're of God. Many false prophets have gone out. Every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh, and every spirit that does not confess that it's the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now already in the world. So let's look at the test. Uh, tested by the word. All scripture is given for inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. That should be level one for any biblically literate person. You should know. i got to test this by the word. The scripture validate that? Secondly, tested by the actual spirit. 
that it's not a doctrine of demons. Because he declares that in the latter times, that will exist. So you're going to have to test what kind of spirit it is. And test it by, you know, is it human spirit, evil spirit, holy spirit? You have the ability to make that distinction, and you need to. If you're going to help somebody, you need to know those things. Uh, tested by the fruit, and we've said that before. God's voice produces good fruit. Can you bear witness with the voice produces the fruit? You know, I believe we're having a company of people trained to where you're going to learn automatically to pay attention to what's on the words that someone's saying to you. What's, on, what's attached to them? It's not just the information, but there's always a line of authority. Good or bad, there's always a line of authority on every word that comes out of your mouth. <coughs> and test by the fruit. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Every good tree bears good fruit. Bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And the words that... Uh, that need to become part and parcel of our life is we need to look more clearly at initiative. Who's, who started this? And I use all different words for that same concept. Initiative, what is the source? Uh, Jennifer didn't like source, so we said initiative. Or motive. Motive is quite clear. Motive is the same thing. Where is it coming from? Regardless of what's being said, where is it coming from? The source, who's initiating it, who's initiating, where's the power behind the words, motive, uh, charismatic terminology, we say prompting, there was a prompting, I was prompted by the Spirit, okay, uh, I have an inner witness to the Spirit, those are all legitimate terms, but whatever term you use, you want to know what's behind, what's the personality and the power behind what is being said or done. That's what, what really matters. And <clears throat> when it comes to the mind, will, and the emotions, it's easy. You could make a little, put a little thing in your Bible just as a reminder. But the, in, the revelation should rule your mind. Revelation should have the main thing. We see it on Tuesday night. You're getting revelation, but it's, it's coming to the mind, and then you, what? Express it. And most of the expression that I hear on a Tuesday night, matter of fact, all of the expression I've heard on a Tuesday night has an element of the love of God behind it. That's, that's a secure, safe place to see, hear, and touch. I mean, I've been in places where they needed a lot of correction. Not so with us on Tuesday night. The conscience should rule over the will. Why the conscience? The conscience is like the voice of your spirit. Conscience can tell you quickly, eh, no, don't do it, or ah, uh, yes, yeah. When the conscience and the will from your spirit are, are intermingled, it's kind of like an inner yes, an ah, an agreeableness. Because remember, we're talking about alignment. All of a sudden, your spirit and God's spirit are in alignment with that thought or that action. And it goes, ah, yes, and it flows because it flows in a straight line. Now, that communion should override the emotions. What do I mean by communion? I mean touching, moment by moment relationship, awareness, abiding. When you abide, you're not only touching, you're embracing and you're in communion. You're in co Union, you're in union and you're co laboring in that union, and it's a constant, which is the goal. You don't want just a touch from God, you want to abide there, you want communion. So, communion should rule over your emotions. You notice what's interesting here God made you a thinking, feeling, willing being, He didn't want to annihilate any of those. People who stuff or suppress any one of those three, you know, they try to make their mind blank. That's ridiculous. 
They try to say, I don't have emotions. I stuff them. And the will, oh, I, my, my will belongs to God. I just do whatever. Free will. There's no such thing in that realm of free will other than that which is under a law. You're going to serve somebody. It's either under the law of the spirit of life or the law of sin and death. Free will, there's not a third choice there. <laughs> it's one or the other. Who's ruling you, the world, the flesh, the devil, or God? There's no, there's no other choices. So God's basically saying, revelation over the mind, conscience over the will, communion over the emotions. And you'd be living in a straight line. You'd be walking the walk. And if you got out of that realm, you can reconnect by receiving forgiveness for having drifted from the, from the communion. God didn't go anywhere. You're humbling yourself and saying, I drifted. Now, how to develop that discernment? A spiritual person is to discern or assess all things. So it's not just when a gift is flowing, it's moment by moment relationship. Discernment is for now. It's for a constant, like a walk in the spirit. All right. Uh, Philippians 1.9, and this I pray that your love would overflow more and more in real knowledge, that's intimate knowledge, and all discernment. And scripture talks about adding to it, adding to your faith. But the first place you start with to develop your discernment, the very first place you must start with, a, with in your prayer time, letting the word discern your heart. You don't really know what's going on. And you say, well, I, I think I hear from God now and then. I don't know. You don't hear from God until you let the word speak to your spirit. And you need to let it discern you. And if something goes, eh, pay attention to that. It could be correction. It could be encouragement. It could be a lot of things. But the fact is, did the word discern you before you discern somebody else? <laughs> Before you're usable, you have to start at part, point one. Point one is start with the living word and let the word discern you. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. The word will tell you this is soulish, this is spirit, this is good, this is evil. It separates. And there's no creature hidden from his sight. And I love that third, second verse. Uh, the second verse, Hebrews 4.12, is the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than the two-edged sword. It separates joints and marrows, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It'll go for the motive. It'll tell you what's really going on. It'll tell you who's behind it. It'll tell you who's behind it. If you were selfish in a particular area, and you were reading the word, and all of a sudden it gets down in there and goes, mm -hmm. it's all about you, isn't it? Uh, oh, yeah. It will discern the thoughts and intents or motives of your heart. Then an honest person will deal with it accordingly. Now, I always like verse 13 because the Holy Spirit is not it to me. He's a person. It's God. So I treat him and respect him as a person. And it says, it's talking about the word of God is quick and powerful. And then the very next verse says, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him not it. All things are open and naked to the eyes of him. That's your Jesus on the inside. That's the author of that word that you're letting discern you. You're letting Jesus look at you. It's like going, like going to the doctor and getting an x-ray. The only difference is you see the results immediately. <laughs> Second part to developing your discernment, to go deeper, this is I really feel this is why God developed Tuesday night for total participation, not me doing just the teaching. And the purpose is to go deeper. You must use what you have. And we would give space quite clearly on Tuesday night. You're given space to do or not to do, but you're given space. And that's God honoring, isn't it? To give him space to do or not to do. 
I know. To go deeper, you've got to use what we have. The third element is understanding why the scripture even calls it the milk of the word. It says, uh, solid food belongs to those who are full age, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. But you're to desire the sincere milk of the word, but that's for babes. It's for milk is for those who have not developed daily discernment. So you've got to start somewhere. So start with the milk of the word and just take the commonplace scriptures that everybody knows, ones that you could even quote, even as a new Christian, you could quote it and let it, let it wash over your heart. You desire that milk, the day will come you'll get meat. But it comes by reason of use. If you don't use the milk, don't expect meat. As a matter of fact, if you came to this church saying, I don't have any idea what they're talking about, it's because you need milk. You, need, you haven't hungered and thirst after milk. A lot of what we give is meat. But meat belongs to those who are a full age, who by reason of use had their senses exercised. You have to practice. Practice makes permanent. Now, milk is for those who have not developed daily discernment. The fourth element is direction comes from the spirit, not the soul or the body. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And we say this over and over again. Acknowledge is not mental. To acknowledge him in all your ways is to acknowledge him from the belly. Awareness. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. That's the direction has to come from the spirit. That is the proper element. Remember we said, you can't see with your ears. You can't hear with your eyes. But if you insist, don't say that it's not there. It's you're using the wrong organ. It's there all right. God's spirit's there all right. But if you're using the wrong organ, you're just using your head. Forget it. But don't say it's not there. What's not there is you. You are not there. You're using the wrong organ. You're using your head to discern spirit. Not going to happen. No more than hearing is going to come from your eyes and seeing is going to come from your ears. It's the wrong organ. Don't expect it. So direction must come from the spirit. That's the fourth element of developing your discernment. The fifth element, your spiritual strength is equal to your drinking, feeding, and exercising. That's simple enough. When you feed instead of read, when you drink instead of just think, and then you practice what you've assimilated, that's like food. It's that which has been assimilated, you practice and you exercise your faith by what you see, hear, and feel. Your spirit strength is equal to your drinking, feeding, and exercising. The sixth element. You develop a spiritual relationship and you co-labor with others. That's predetermining that you can meet one another by the Spirit. Do you know one another by the Spirit or you just know them according to their name, address, and what you know about their history? But when you know somebody by the Spirit, I used to lay down during worship service in my first pastorate. I'd lay down while they were doing worship practice. We had four different worship teams and so it was like all kinds of stuff going on flags banner all this stuff was going on I'd lay down and someone would come over and say Pat and not say anything and put their hand on my shoulder and in many cases not all but in many cases I know who it was without opening my eyes just by the flavor of their spirit you need to do that too that's that that's not pie in the sky what it is is it means you're so into your head that you're missing most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh if you can't get quiet you're gonna miss out on the best thing that God has for you and I but you've got to quiet that noisy flesh you got to take that hyperactivity out that once hyper once emotionalism once the dramatic it's an adrenaline junkie more than a spiritual person 
most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. So in other words, you can live from one spectacular moment to another, and they come, and they're wonderful. But in between, you basically didn't do much. Because the moment by moment doesn't mean enough to you. But that's where you develop daily discernment. Your spirit strength is equal to that ability to drink. Your spiritual relationship is to co-labor with others. You're not ready. One of the signs of maturity is you're ready for corporate life. You're ready to labor with other people. You're ready to make proper connections. If you're still an independent self, self still hasn't been crucified, no matter how much Bible you know. Develop a spiritual relationship. God intends to build a dwelling place. Uh, our verse of scripture from the beginning was Ephesians 2.22 of which God told me meant much later in your ministry you'll see it happen. And that to me is now. And in the next two months, I'm, I'm evaluating a lot of things that need to take place in the next two months for the next year. And I'm believing that what God called was in whom you are being built together. That's not just an individual. I don't know why people have no consciousness of it other than their relationship with intimacy with God is lacking. You also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. And I already said the next point. Most supernatural is too quiet for the flesh. That's the eighth point. The ninth point, we've already said this as well. The soul, not your spirit, your soul. The soul wants hype, excitement. It learns to judge spiritual things by becoming anxious or suspicious. I once had a leader that was always claiming discernment and it was always paranoia. Never did see the healing of that because they were convinced they had discernment. But it was, it was suspicion. See that person talking on the cell phone over there? I know they're talking about me. <laughs> Paranoia is easy. It's a product of fear, and it's not discernment. So cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Here's the other part that will save you a lot of aggravation. When you perceive an atmosphere that's not conducive to loving God, honor God by not owning it. In other words, bear witness to it. Ah, this is such. You can even learn to pray accordingly. I still say that when I worked at that halfway house, right before a guy wanted to make a break for it, the atmosphere in the room changed noticeably. And even the guy who was not necessarily, the, there was another pastor there who was not necessarily real discerning, but he had enough discernment to know that. So even at times, even a newbie can understand that. All of a sudden he said, oh, and I'm going, mm, and he knew something was going to happen, and sure enough he did. And the guy grabbed a knife and didn't take his medication and the atmosphere was charged with uh, fear and terror. Uh, fortunately, the supernatural power of peace was greater. But all in all, you don't have to own it just because it manifests. Oops. I'm going to close with a section of scripture that also gives kind of an outline on how to develop it, using a little different terminology, how to develop your discernment. And I always like the, the, the title over this portion of Scripture. It's in 2 Peter, you can write this down, chapter 1, just verses 2 to 9. And the verses read, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 
we're really without an excuse, aren't we? He's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which you have been given exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you might be partaker, that means you own it, partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And here's a, here's a good portion of scripture that you can use in your private time to enhance your discernment and look at these. And I'll give you like a little phrase behind each one that you can kind of use as a, uh, in your prayer time as a devotional. All right. Uh, add, but for this reason, add to your faith. This is starting in verse five. Add to your faith with all diligence, virtue. And if you see, there's knowledge, self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. I want to read that again. For also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, to self-control patience, to perseverance godliness, in godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness to love. For if these things are yours and they abound, you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel. Do you believe that? Jesus is the treasure in your earthen vessel? But it says the excellency of the power might be of God, not of us. That's the whole purpose of the message. The whole purpose of the message is that the excellency of the power that's coming from us is not us, but God. It's up to us to make the difference, to be in a straight line, spirit, soul, body, in a straight line, proper alignment. God being the source. Now, here's the um, seven elements. Adding to your faith virtue. What does that mean? Substance, inner strength character corresponding with a good impression that can be made to others in other words when you add virtue substance to your faith it's observable by other people you know the scripture talks about that we were called to be living epistles whose lives are read by other people people are reading your life they're not just listening to what you say they're reading your life You're an expression. You're to be an expression of God. So if you're going to add and really develop your your discernment, you're going to have to add substance, inner strength, substance, something that's real that can be reflected to where people can see it. Moral excellence, virtue. I like that Bishop Hammond used to send my first church prophets. We have prophets come visit regularly, but they all had the 10 M's. To deal with morality, marriage, motive, and we evaluated them. They were not afraid to have their character uh, checked. And so you add to your faith virtue so that you'd walk worthy in the Lord, fully pleasing in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Okay, the next one, knowledge. By discernment, We know virtue needs to have substance to it. It needs to be real. Knowledge is talking about inner knowings, not head knowledge. That is not referring to head knowledge. It's referring to spiritual knowledge or knowings, intimate knowledge. Add to your faith substance, reality, inner knowings. The third element, self-control, meekness. And next to self-control, you put down soul taming. That's a good way to look at self-control. You're taming that soul. You're not annihilating it. You're taming it so that it flows in a straight line and the spirit is Lord. Soul taming. That means you can wait quietly. You can... You know how to wean that flesh from its appetites of wanting to do something, that hyperness of activity. 
and you've learned to tame that soul to get it under authority, weaning that soul from its rule. Patience. Patience, spiritually, is holding the heart open. Hope and, and patience, to me, are, are kind of synonymous. Patience is holding the heart open. Hope holds the heart open till love comes through. But holding the heart open and patience means that I'm opening up to God's timing, not my flesh's timing. Flesh's timing is always faster, always more imminent. I got I, I to do it now. I got to do it now. But patience is spirit schedule versus your soul schedule. And trust me, you do have a soul schedule of when you think something should happen and when God reveals to you his timetable. So we're looking at timetables right now, particularly. Godliness. Godliness is understanding that you have to be a son or a daughter unto God before you're of value to be a father or a mother unto others. You really need to be unto God first before you can be of help to other people of any significance. In other words, we used to say you have to be a son to the father before you can be father to sons. And vice versa for ladies, mothers, you need to be a daughter of God first before you can truly be a woman who has that instinct to uh, take them along on a, on a reparenting adventure in God. Brotherly kindness. Really, brotherly kindness is going to require a greater revelation of forgiveness. No matter where you're at, you can always improve on your revelation of forgiveness. Unforgiveness is the killer of discernment. It's the silent killer of discernment. Any unforgiveness in your heart, I don't trust your discernment anymore I could throw you. Because it's unreliable. Unforgiveness makes you unreliable as far as your perception of what's going on. It's the silent killer of discernment. Love. Love is the character and abounding love. And real discernment the, comes out of abounding love. That your love may abound still more and more in real intimate knowledge and all discernment. And faith works by that love, doesn't it? And God is basically saying, and I love this little in inclusion in 2 Peter 1, in verse 8 and 9, just in case you missed the point, <laughs> that this is all to be discerned and applied as upon a partaker of that divine nature. There's a little, little footnote kind of like scripture. <laughs> if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old lifestyle. These things must be in you, not just preached to you. That's the indication. The indication is God's looking for a life change. Amen? I almost finished. Wow! Part four, I can hear it coming. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for this day, for this time. Take these people and bring a level of discernment, increase and abound, knowing that there's nothing to fear because fear is the opposite of the discernment that you need, which is love. God wants you to be greater lovers of God and one another. And that it means I'm going to have to get rid of the hindrances. I'm going to have to honestly let God search my heart and remove the hindrances, particularly unforgiveness which is the silent killer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, 
That's forgive123.com.